I'm going to say the same, right? Sex, drugs, drugs and, rock and rock and roll. roll. Now, when I say that, that is the epitome of certain individuals and certain groups, but the Rolling Stones, man, I mean, they uh, they were it. That, that, that was them. Whether you're into the music or not, they were the backbone of so much culture around the world and so much influence. So what the hell was that like going out with someone in the Rolling Stones? Well, when I met Ronnie, I met him at a party. I hadn't been out with a musician or anything like that. And we just sort of hooked up and, and it was just, I was off and I was running, you know. And I just sort of fell into it quite easily. <laughs> I don't know why. I have the official Josephine, which is your official name. Yes. Wood on the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. No problem whatsoever. So I'm going to just reel off a few accolades. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, actress, presenter, model, uh, podcast host, dancer, uh, world travelled, absolute connoisseur of different cultures. Someone that is an open book. Someone that is very open minded as well. So. I've just mentioned a few things that you're known for. Um, I want to dive into a part that I am really intrigued about. Yeah. Your podcast. Oh, yeah. It's about, it's about your view, your take, your belief on, yeah. on aliens. And I, if, if I put my cards on the table, I do believe there's something else out there. I've got no yeah. actual real proof and I've never really studied it. But there's far too many people around the world, including, uh, what's his name, Joe Rogan, that speaks, love Joe Rogan. I love him. Yeah, I think he's great. Yeah. Um, who speak about it quite a lot. So have you had any interactions? Have you ha had, uh, I know, a real like sort of discovery moment with like yeah. UFOs, etc.? And why did you decide to do a podcast on, on aliens? Well, um, the funny thing is, is that when I was a kid, I was at a convent. And when I was a kid, I remember, come, you know, it was all about God and all that. And I used to think... You know, the nuns would all go on and on and on about it. And my dad was an atheist. And one day I went, in, it was a Sunday morning, and he was reading the supplement. And the front of it said, was Jesus an astronaut? And it said something about the halos being, could be the space helmets and the star in the sky and all this sort of thing. And I was fascinated. I was just fascinated. And it just, and my brother and me used to always say, what's out there what is out there it's so vast out there there's got to be other people living in the universe so we had this whole thing going on anyway i sort of forgot about it and then uh about 15 years ago i was on holiday in recife in brazil with my ex ronnie and the kids and we were packing up what well, i was packing up to leave the next day to go back to Sao Paulo. And he, it was about midnight, and he'd been drinking all day as usual. And, and he started saying, Joe, Joe, get out here, get out here. And where we were, where was the house, and it was on a bit high up, and then you went down these steps and onto the beach, and then it was the sea right out there. And he said, come and see this weird stuff in the sky. So I went out, and there was this, dark thing because it was dark but you know when it's dark you can mm. see and the lights were going down onto the sea just from underneath like that i said what the hell is that and he ran in to get his glasses and as he ran in it just lifted up like that and then it shot off to the right and stopped and then it shot across the sky at a speed that was unbelievable and I just stood there and I went, oh shit, that was a UFO. It was nothing else it could be. And we got on the plane the next day and uh, <clears throat> we um, picked up the paper and it said UFO invaders Brazil and the air hostess translated it for us and hundreds of people had seen the same thing. And I was absolutely addicted from that point onwards. And then uh, a couple of years ago, my friend Mike, who used to be a producer at Radio 2, Mike Hansen, uh, he said, Joe, I'm leaving Radio 2. He's Canadian. <laughs> uh, I'm leaving Radio 2 and I'm going to start doing my podcast. Podcast, I said. He said, yeah. He said, if you come up with a great idea, 
and I like it, we'll do it. I said, yep, aliens, UFOs and aliens. He went, you got it, we're doing it. So that's how it all started. Lovely stuff. So how do you go, I mean, do you I know, put a plan out to go to different countries to try and spot or to try and discover UFOs or sightings or where sightings that have been? And how do you go about, how do you go about just researching aliens? Well, for a start, I watch Ancient Aliens on the telly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I follow lots of sites um, and I've just got to know lots of people. You know, I went to the UFO convention in 2018, or was it 19, 19, um, in Manchester and I met lots of people there. Um, but then once I started doing my podcast, people would just write to me and say, I've got a great story. Or I was at a party once and... And I just talked to Sean Ryder and finished that podcast. I went to this party and this guy said, and I said, what have you been doing, Joe? I said, I've just done a podcast with Sean Ryder. And he said, oh, he said, wait, there's a, my mate's coming. And he uh, was on holiday with four mates in the south of France and they were abducted. Shut I up. went, oh my God. So I got him out on the podcast. So... I mean, I don't even know how to get my sort of head around it almost, like, because it's, it's, it's so out there. But, like I said at the start, I do believe there is, it can't be just humans on the planet. There's or, no or, way. Or in the universe. It's got to be other living things. We, so how do you start be. entering a conversation to someone who has been abducted by a UFO or aliens? Well, I just said, come on, tell us your story. <laughs> and he started saying, yeah, well, I went, we were with these you know, uh, he's with his mates and he, people, uh, people have had experiences, uh, want to tell them. And if you make them feel they're mad, they won't tell you their stories. Of course. And so, uh, and I love to believe, I want to believe it all. And I do most of the time, even the wacky ones, I think, well, who am I to say they're lying? Yeah. You know, <clears throat> they most probably they believe it so much that I believe it too. So, as a kid, the stereotypical type of sighting description of a UFO and then the alien is, it's a flying saucer, beams come down, and then an alien comes out with a big head, big black eyes, skinny little body, and they talk to you in a weird way. That, that's just the greys. Yeah. So, like, how did these people describe aliens? There's, apparently, there's thousands of them I had one girl that they they would she would see them uh, in her room they would just appear in the room that they were purple I mean I don't know what color they are maybe they are purple and she said she would sit up and she would talk to them mentally um, uh, but there's all sorts of different aliens there's ones that are there's the reptilians there's the which aren't supposed to be such good guys um there's the tall like tall greys there's um oh, there's all sorts of them there's loads of them well there's got to be there are more stars in the sky than there are grains of sand on every beach in this world i know i've heard that as well so with the reptilians because i i have heard well you mentioned about david Icke coming onto your podcast and funny enough the guy who got me into podcasting is a guy called rob moore he's got a um podcast called the disruptive entrepreneur great guy great podcast he's actually interviewed david ike and then i listened to david ike on brian rose's podcast called london real a few times and i think i think he's great you know love him or hate him he speaks brian rose is that guy that wants to be mayor isn't he canadian or american guy yeah american yeah, guy yeah american yeah. guy and he just speaks his own truth and i and yeah. i admire that about people and he, i think he said that the reptilians live amongst humans yeah they're yeah? shapeshifters Okay, what does that mean? Shapeshifters. Well, um, uh, David Icke explained it, uh, where well, I can't. But it's because we only see such a small amount, our vision, we only see such a small amount. They are there, but we just don't see them. And sudden, uh, you'll have to listen to my podcast. <laughs> okay. When are you interviewing him? I've done it. You've done it already? It comes okay. out on the 22nd. Amazing. And what is your podcast called? Alien Nation. So it's strictly about aliens. Is there anything else on there? Uh, 
there's some uh, there are a couple of uh, things about spiritual things but you know there's such a huge connection between that i found when talking to people you know i don't know i i thought by doing a podcast i would find out more talking about aliens and ufo's and what's the unknown but in actual fact it left me more confused than ever before mm. because it opened my mind to oh my god all this stuff yeah and so i don't know you know what now yeah. but i'm just going to keep going and, and talking to people i'm going to definitely have a listen to it um a bit of a weird question if i was to get abducted or the thought of being abducted it's actually quite scary because in, in essentially you're being kidnapped by not another human but by i mean another human would be scary but another kind of living thing is going to be bonkers. Do you ever think about being abducted by aliens because you put so much concentration on them? I'd love to be abducted. <laughs> <laughs> Have you... I know that's crazy, but I, I would love to... I wouldn't be surprised if I have been abducted. And your memory's been wiped or something. Yeah, because I have dreams of me floating and, and flying just by myself if I can breathe out breathe out I can get higher and higher and higher and higher maybe that was me being abducted <laughs> when I when I left school I wanted to be a, a um, in the Royal Air Force and I wanted to be a fighter pilot do not not do not know why I had a, a fascination with uh, airplanes jets fighter jets etc plus I like to keep fit etc and I follow still now quite a lot of pages on social media to do with airplanes and the RAF and that kind of stuff. My dad was in the RAF. Yeah, and so my granddad, both my granddads were. So oh, yeah. I think there's, there might be a bit of a tie there. And um, anyway, there's been a few in the last six months, I think even on Fox News, where an RAF, not an RAF, it was the American yeah, version. Yeah, and they They spotted them. that that black dot that yeah. suddenly just disappeared in the ocean. And as he was commentating, yeah. he's saying... This thing, we, can, we couldn't even pick it up. We couldn't even track how it's flying. It, it made no, it wasn't aerodynamic. It was just like this ball. And he said, there is something else out there. So the question I got to you is, if there is aliens and they do come here, invade or even visit, do you think they'll come with a purpose to take over, to be friends? Uh, I don't know. It depends. I think there are good guys, uh, as Dan Aykroyd, because Dan Aykroyd talked to me as well. Just drop that in. Uh, and he said they're good guys and they're bad guys, like okay. everything, you know. And he said the good guys just like to look at the planet because it's so beautiful. Our planet is beautiful. When looking at it from out there, it's just this beautiful blue planet. Um, and then there's going to be the bad guys. Who knows what they want to do? But I did talk to somebody about an alien race <clears throat> that they believe... Um, uh, they thrive on fear. So the more fear, it, it's like, because it's an energy, isn't it? Mm. So if we're all in fear... Kind of like what we are now with COVID. Exactly. And that's what gives them... That's what they thrive off. And it's called some weird name like louche. But I saw a great thing on online on it a couple of years ago, and now I can't find it anywhere. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so there's going to be the good guys and there's going to be the bad guys. So jump in slightly uh, conversation. Um, you come up with a mantra, which is love the planet. Be go, organic. Go organic. I was going to say, but is it be organic? Be organic, yeah. Um, which, I've, which I love. Um, I adapted my, my diet three nearly three years ago now. Um, I'm not full vegan, but I'm pescatarian and I, I do a, you're sort of vegan vegetarian during the week and then occasionally have a bit of fish. And yeah. I feel, found it's really worked for me and I just feel better because of it. Yeah. So I know that slogan mantra followed, you had quite a bad illness yeah. many, many years ago. Was that what promoted this kind of yeah. well-being, wellness, uh, wellness kind of attitude? Yeah, well, what happened is that I was misdiagnosed, misdiagnosed with Crohn's disease and they shoved me on steroids for two years. And I tell you, this thing about steroids, they took my soul away, you know. I just never experienced not feeling like me. And it was, and, oh, it was awful, you know, and I was all bloated and it just, they, they were, and I thought, I can't live like this. So I, I did this uh, interview for the Daily Express 
and it said on the came out Stone's wife in incurable disease. Oh, great! But they then the uh, paper rang up and said we've got a huge bag of mail for you because that's before we had internet, wasn't it? Ninety one. Mm. And so they sent it over and I sat on the floor and I read every letter in that bag. And I came across this letter with this erratic writing and it said, Joe, I read your story. I'll put your Crohn's into remission for life if you follow my diet and take my herbs. I got in my car, I rang him up. He said, come and see me. I got in the car, drove down to Hastings, found his house, it was called Shangri-La. Went in there, he's an old boy, and he had just pestles and mortars and jars and everything everywhere. And he sat me down and he said, what do you eat? I thought, what do I eat? What is he talking about? I said, well, I'll get the kids pizza, I, I uh, you know, make a roast on a Sunday, I do lean cuisine, frozen meals for me and my sister, you know. And he, st- and he started telling me about food. He taught me all about genetically modified food, the chemicals we spray on our food, the meat that's pumped with hormones, the chickens that are pumped with hormones and antibiotics. And and I sat there and I listened to him and it all made sense. I thought, why on earth have we gone so far away from what we're naturally supposed to be eating and we're all eating crap? And that was in 91. So I went home and I um, said, right, I'm changing it. It was so difficult at that time. And I found an organic farm down in Devon. And she came to London once a month. And once a month, she bought me a big box of vegetables. And that's how it all started. So I cleaned out my system on a really strict diet. No um, uh, deadly nightshade vegetables like potatoes, courgettes, peppers, all that. They're all deadly nightshade vegetables. Mushrooms, are they in it? I could eat mushrooms. Um, clean, detoxed. We went off my steroids. I never went back to the doctor. Went off my steroids, cleaned my system out, and I was feeling so great. Went down to the country, see my friend, and got these pains. They rushed me into hospital. They did exploratory surgery and found out I had a perforated appendix for two years. They said it was amazing that I was alive. Wow. So I laid in hospital and thought, from this day onwards, I am going to be an organic girl. And I am like that now. So uh, you mentioned about the, the vegetables and stuff. I'm really intrigued by this sort of stuff because I've had a, almost a few times like epiphany moment where people are like, dis-ease. You start eating things that create dis-ease. dis-ease yeah. and, and it made so much sense. Like you're eating dead, rotten flesh. And I know, look. The, dead food. It's like, and, and I totally, I totally get it. Like, I think, I personally think you can eat a little bit of it. But when people say to me, everything is okay in moderation. Okay, explain what moderation is. Because that has to be backed up by real facts and science. And I think if you're eating it three times a day, that's not moderation. You're just kidding yourself. I think you see the body needs you need to feed the body with nutrients with that life. are alive and make your cells feel your body feel good you have to do that otherwise you're eating that deliveroo and all that all the time you're not going to keep a healthy body you're just not so what is your diet now oh my diet now <clears throat> right so say this morning i had a a matcha latte made with oat milk. Um, but I also put in a teaspoonful of maca powder. Yes. Maca's really good for uh, women, especially. Gives you energy. Then I had some gluten free organic cereal. Uh, then, well, then today I, I ha- went to lunch. But you see, I, it, the, the worst thing is, is that I look at food now and look at it differently. So unless I know what I'm eating or I've cooked it myself. Are uh, you like a, a vegan or ve- vegetarian or? No, a pescatarian. Pescatarian. I, I love a bit of fish. I think my body needs fish. Um, but I just eat all fresh vegetables and, <coughs> and stuff like that. What about um, uh, juicing and fasting? Do you do anything like that? Yeah, occasionally fast. I, should, I could do with another one now. But um, juicing, yes, I... 
I'm We've got tic- cold, cold press juices in the fridge if you want. I, we, oh, yeah? I do it every single morning. Uh, you know, the great one is uh, celery juice. Yes, amazing. Yeah. I, I sometimes think, right, I feel like I have to drink celery juice. So I'll do three or four days in the morning celery juice. And it's funny that you said misdiagnosed of uh, Crohn's disease because I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in Lewisham Hospital by a guy called Dr. Oh, Williams, were? I think. And then I went to Guy's, and the guy, the, the guy, a guy said to me, "No, this isn't this isn't Crohn's. It's a, it's a version of IBS, but it's not Crohn's. He put it down to something else, and I had to have a bit of a surgery to, in my bowel, cut out a little bit of inflamed bit." Um, yeah, lucky. I, I had my uh, part of my large intestine, part of my small intestine, yeah. and that valve. And he said, "You." you know might have a little problem but i haven't had any problem because i'm so fanatic about what i eat yeah and i found that doing the juicing i train a lot anyway i box so i'm oh, I I, box. Know, yeah i'm competing in march actually and I've, I, I've had a few fights and stuff and i find that when i'm training and i'm doing the juicing and i'm not eating crap my my, my, my body and my stall is all all good but the moment yeah. i eat absolute compressed food which is you death, can really feel it yeah, can't you yeah it really... changes my mood yeah, I really feel it. When I'm eating good and I'm on a real good roll, I'm not going out to dinner, everything, I'm at home, da 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 like that. I'm good, you know. Like, and then I, I'll have a drink. I mean, I, you know, I don't drink much anymore, but I'll have a drink. What's but I, I won't drink, I won't have Coca-Cola, I won't have no. fizzy drinks, I won't do anything like that. No, me, me neither. I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong, there's the occasion where I've had a bit of a hangover and someone gives me an orange Fanta, but that's about as far as it goes. I haven't had an orange Fanta in donkey's <laughs> years, I can't believe that. They, they are lovely, but they're, they're <laughs> no good for you. What, uh, on, on the subject of drink, what's your favourite alcoholic drink? Tequila! Really? It's <laughs> yeah. probably the cleanest alcohol it you could have. It is clean. And the thing about tequila... It is, uh, it's not a depressant alcohol. Okay. Yeah. I love red wine. Oh, you That's, do? Yeah, I love it. Do you it. drink uh, organic red wine? I've had it a few times, it's yeah. It's a great one in Waitrose. I can't remember what it's <coughs> called, but it's got an orange label. It's really, really good. Yeah? You find it in Waitrose. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you got a, uh, a business circulating your your wellness, well-being? Yeah, so after I, once I got well, uh, and I started, I started reading stuff, you know, I started reading about what you put in your body. And then one day uh, somebody gave me, oh no, my brother gave me a book called um, The Fragrant Pharmacy. And I was wondering at that time, what, what am I putting on my body? Because I also heard that what you put on your skin goes straight into your bloodstream. bloodstream and you just got to think of a Nicorette patch. I started making up little bottles of oils to give to my friends and my girlfriend Donna said why don't you do it properly Joe and I went nah nah and then everybody at home was doing their thing the kids were doing their things and I thought what am I doing I'm going to start my own business uh, and I've met this girl called Josephine Farley okay she started green and blacks and she's a mad organic woman it was like yes uh, and I went for lunch with her and she recommended me a formulator and I Colette and I got a hold of her and started because I I found it a way to when I'm talking about my products to change women's minds so they start thinking about what they're putting on their body, what they wash their hair with, you yeah. know, all of that stuff. Um, and so that's I was I'm very proud that I was one of the first people I know to start an organic beauty brand. It's funny because I've just turned 36 yesterday and I'm still not... Happy birthday for yesterday. Thank you very much. Sagittarian. I am, I am. And there was a saying that my sort of, I don't think it was my dad, but it was like in his circle when I was growing up, which is like, as you grow older, you start to realise you, you, you know almost less. Like the more you start researching, you find out actually you don't know so much. Yeah. and there's a lot of truth in it because when I started looking at you're probably much more well-rounded with the whole well-being and nutrition side of things but I've interviewed a lot of people there's a guy called Coop DC who's strictly plant-based and he's so in good shape his daughter's in great shape his missus is in great shape and he said the same thing to me he said what you put in your body sinks into your bloodstream so he said when you put a bit of um, 
aftershave on and you keep on doing it every single day it takes about your biggest organ on your body is your skin yeah so after about 15 seconds it gets absorbed and it's fine once or twice but if you keep on doing it every single day that's how you become sick again disease yeah and he said even the stuff you put in my hair so like because i was doing a podcast i obviously want to put something in my hair but on the, on the weekend i normally put on hats or in, the, in you know if i'm not meeting anyone i just put a hat on i don't put aftershave on anymore and it, it's, it's hey because, you should buy my fragrance yeah i will i will it I will. is all organic that's good but it doesn't stay on when you buy a real good organic fragrance it doesn't stay on the skin long because it's not full of chemicals so like it's funny is it because the more you start learning about this stuff you start to think okay if i do that it's actually going to have a bit of a a knock-on effect or if i i don't know eat this or put this in my hair you start to think about it a bit more and some people might say that's a bit over the top but i think I, I like to pick my battles. You know, if I'm going to have a drink, I know that's a battle in in itself. Yeah. If I'm going to eat this crap, I've got to be prepared for the repercussions day, yeah. days later on. And I think I think that's the importance of it, being aware about it. Yeah. And and the more you do it, I mean, the more you do it, the, the more you... You know, like I sit in front of the telly, not that I watch much telly, uh, but when I sit in front of the telly and I watch the ads on the TV and I think, Crap food, crap food. Medication. Medication. You And you just see it <clears> everywhere, <throat> you know, and you can't not see it. And I, I just find it amazing. And I go over to friends' houses that have got money that could buy all organic food all the time, and I look in their fridges and I think, oh. I think Why I, are they eating this if you can afford not to? I think a lot, a lot of the time, I can't speak for everybody, but the people that I know who also got some money, but occasionally or, or, or mo- most of the time they're not eating really good stuff. One is the education. They're not being educated enough because they've not bothered to go out there. And the second thing is it's laziness. It's easy just to pick up the phone and order something. Yeah. I, I think that's the problem. It's the education and how easy getting bad food or bad drink into your body is. I mean, if you go into a supermarket, a litre of water is more expensive than a litre of Coca-Cola, which is the totally wrong culture. It's just so wrong, isn't it? How do we change it? I mean, I can all I can do is just keep battling on and talking about it. I think we need to talk about it and have that discussion and make people think, is this good for me? Is this going to give me the nutrition that I need? That's what we have to do. Absolutely. People have to start thinking that way. Um, it's normally a little bit rude for a man to ask a, a female how old you are. And the only reason why I'm going to ask you is because you're in great nick and you've got so much energy. I mean, you're a clear example that how you're living your life is making you upbeat and you're still a go-getter. So can I, can I, can I ask how old you are? Yes, I'm 66. Mate, if, I, if I've got your energy at 66, I'm winning in life. God, I'm getting old. I can't believe I'm 66. <laughs> I don't feel like 66. I just don't feel it at all. Age is such a weird thing. It is. I was at um, the pub a few months ago, and this woman came up. I was talking to my friend Debbie, and this woman came up. She said, <clears throat> oh, she said, my age, she goes, I mean, she looked quite old. <laughs> I must say, on oh, my age, she goes, Ah, oh, it's just not the same anymore. I feel really, oh. And she was moaning and groaning. I said, how old are you then? She said, I'm 61. I said, I'm 66. <laughs> and she went, oh, oh, and she walked off. <laughs> but it, it really is. Like, when I say this sort of stuff to my dad, he's a bit old school and he's, like, very kind of stuck in his way and talking about the whole corona thing and the vaccine thing. He's very much, these people on TV, they're the experts and we must yeah. listen to them, all that kind of stuff. But... When I go around his house, he's microwaving a ready meal spaghetti bolognese, and he actually says to me, "This is healthy," and he believes it. He absolutely believes it, and he and he's he's a full believer of when you get to a certain age, you're going to d- deteriorate. And I'm I'm like, no. You know the what? only reason why you deteriorate is because what you put in your body. Yeah. So so I mean, I think you can get away with a hell of a lot when you're younger. I For sure. did. I did. I mean, I was. I, I hardly ate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And then, but I think as you get older, then you've got to be even more conscious of what you put in your body. Because, I mean, a microwave just zaps all nutrition out of the food. Just zaps it out of the food. So you're eating stuff, just stuff, with nothing that's going to make you feel good. At yeah, all. like wasted calories, they call it, I think. It's just like hollow food. I just right, cardboard. Yeah, it's like pumped to sugar, 
preservatives, yeah. salts. It's now been nuked. It's crazy. It's, it's got nothing. Then. Yeah. What's the point of eating? It's even like the, the, the myth. I, I interviewed a guy called Ruben Tabaris, who was part of the David Hay camp, obviously the boxer. Very, very well rounded with nutrition, well-being, recovery, strength and conditioning. And on my podcast, he said about milk from, from a cow. And he said, do you know what pasteurized mean? And I said, well, well no. I just Boy, heard of shit it. Out of it. He said, what they do, they <laughs> nuke the whole entire milk. And even though they're claiming they're trying to get rid of the bad bacteria to make it safe, they kill all the good bacteria. Yeah. And all you're drinking is, is, is wasted, is nothing. And that's what causes arthritis. And I started thinking, I thought, that actually makes sense. And he said, it's a myth about the whole calcium thing. Yeah. It's you know? absolutely you get more calcium uh, with a bowl of uh, spinach yeah. than, than you would with milk. Now, milk, there was a great, um, I don't know if it's still around, I think it was called um, Mr. Moo or something like that. And you could, I found out about him and you could buy unpasteurized milk. And I'd never had unpasteurized milk and I thought, I have to try it. So you order it and it, you get it delivered to the door and, and it tasted so beautiful. Just like not milk. It had such a lovely taste to it. But I don't drink milk anyway. I haven't drunk milk since the early 90s. Yeah, I've never really been fond of it. And then when I started learning a bit more about it, I was like, no, I'm going to stay clear. Don't get me wrong. Occasionally I have a chocolate bar and that's obviously got milk in it. But I don't go for, you know, like you see people drinking pints of milk. I'm like, that's just crazy. My dad used to just drink it like that. Yeah, mental. Yeah. We spoke about health, but then we you touched on the, about slightly about the old school lifestyle, and yeah. I know you're probably sick and tired of talking about it because so many people are quite intrigued. Quite naturally, Joe Josephine, yeah. you are known for going out with Ronnie Wood. You was actually married to him for X amount of years and got two wonderful children with him. Yeah, um, I'm going to say a saying, right? S- sex, drugs, drugs, and rock, rock and, roll. and roll. Now, when I say that. That is the epitome of certain individuals and certain groups. I would say the Beatles, there's obviously a f- loads of other like high-end pop stars, but the Rolling Stones, man, I mean, they, uh, they were it. That, that, that was them. Yeah. And I think even whether you're into the music or not, they were the backbone of so much culture around the world and so much influence. So what the hell was that like going out with someone in the Rolling Stones? Gosh, I... Um... Well, when I met Ronnie, um, I met him at a party. Uh, I hadn't been out with a musician or anything like that. And we just sort of hooked up and, and it was just, I was off and I was running, you know. And I just sort of fell into it quite easily. <laughs> I don't know why. I could stay up just as long as everybody else, or providing I had the marching powder. Um, and I could drink as much as the guys. And, I, and I'm a bit of a tomboy, I suppose. I've always been like that. I always preferred to hang out with guys and girls. Um, but I used to hang out with, we used to go on tour and it used to be me, Ronnie, Keith all the time. But I never saw, I saw some pretty weird things with the roadies and stuff, shagging girls. But I mean, we... What, what do you mean roadies? What does that mean? The roadies are the guys that fix the guitars and put up the amps and, you know, they're the guys that run around doing all the stuff for them. Okay. They're, and they look after their guitars. Okay, as so, well as looking after the females. Yeah, and they they would bring often they would come up to the room and they'd have a girl that I would have seen in the front of the audience, thinking, "Oh, look at her flashing her tits." And then <laughs> later on, when there's a party in the room, in she'll walk with one of the roadies. And I'm like, oh yeah, I saw her. She's finally got up to the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I mean, we used to just be too high, I suppose, to. There wasn't that much sex, I would say. Mick was the one that was the sex one. He was always, I mean, he, he like was... Like a nymphomaniac. He still is, I think. Really? Um, well, but, if you still get it up, why not? <laughs> but he's got a new baby, hasn't he? Well, two years old. Uh, and he's, what, 78 now? Go, Mick. Go for, yeah, quality. But so uh, it was Keith, and then Patty came along, his wife. So there was the four of us. So we just used to just play music, well, listen to music, me, watch the boys play, take lots of coke, take lots of alcohol, suffer, and then go get back on it again. And so we used to do that all through the tours, and then just have loads of people in your room. Uh, one time, we'd been up for three days straight, and, and I looked at all the mess, 
and the clothes were everywhere. We were leaving in the afternoon, the next afternoon. I looked around and I thought, I'll get an hour's sleep <laughs> and then I'll get up and do it. Next thing we know, the door's broken down, the security, come on, we've got to be at the gig, we're late. Joe, here's some plastic bags, throw everything in it, we're going, you've got 10 minutes. I thought, I'll never, ever do that again. I never did. I always got myself together, always packed before I slept. I remember, so a friend of mine is called Alf, Alpha, and he's got a brother called Benga. And Benga, it was a dubstep DJ. Him and Scream were kind of the pioneers of it. And they always used to say, he's living a rock star's lifestyle. And they would tour the world. They would obviously be drinking drugs, etc. And I, I experienced some of it because I actually went on tour to Belgium with them once. And I got, got to see it all behind the scenes. And it was amazing. But I thought to myself, this is amazing. But if I kept this up every single weekend, I'm going to be absolutely we screwed. Did it. We'd go on tour for a year and a half. Crazy. And, and you pack and you think, right, I've got all sorts of clothes for all climates. Uh, see your house in a year and a half. And off you go, like a like going on a boat out to sea. And um, he, he said to me that it was always known that rock stars would smash up their hotel room. Was that a myth or is that something that st- st- that's stereotype? A myth. That's a myth. Well, Bobby Keys, the uh, saxophone player, he uh, threw a TV out the hotel room window, but uh, that was as bad as it got. That's risky though, isn't Keith it? Keith <laughs> broke the toilet seat and came into our room with the toilet, round his, toilet seat round his neck. Um, you know, just stuff like that, stupid stuff. And um, so, so <laughs> there's not usually. That's unfair for me to say that, but I I imagine that when a performer's on stage, a bit like an artist, really, there's their persona, which is what they do with their fashion, their art, their music, and then there's them as a person. Was Ronnie? Is Ronnie? Same person. Uh, well, you see, for me, when I was with him for like how long was I with Ronnie I suppose over 30 years really uh he was always drinking and doing drugs and then when we split up he had to get clean he was told he had to get clean so I don't know what he's like now and I don't really know him completely sober he's been sober for four years now but I don't know that man I only know the mad one that yeah come on John let's do some more coke oh <laughs> that's the one I know what's the maddest thing you've seen Roddy Woods do he's done all sorts of st- no he's just a, he used to just do stupid things like get under the table in a posh restaurant or you know just do stupid things jump onto Mick's back and Mick go mental on tour you know on stage and he wants climbed up the scaffolding on the stage set and I don't know you know just drunk stuff yeah yeah uh, and um same question to you then what's the maddest thing you've done when you're on tour <laughs> intoxicated with drink and drugs um I once I don't know I suppose I've got a picture of it actually I once dressed up I used to like dressing up <laughs> dressed up as a nun that I think it's because I went to a convent and that kind of thing um but I once dressed up as an old lady. It was I got bored in Keith's room, went to my room, uh, dressed up this old lady, went back down to Keith's room, and they wouldn't let me in. Because they didn't recognise you? Yeah. Really? <laughs> I said, I was just here. My boyfriend's in there. Let me in. They wouldn't let me in, and so I had to go you. home. I had to go back to my room, ring the room, till finally somebody answered. And then they let me in. I thought it was going to be a funny joke, but it backfired. <laughs> so, like, I think uh, I read you met him in 1977. Yeah. Got married in 1985. Obviously yeah. had two kids. Um, over that time, well, between when you met him to 1985, so, you know, good eight years there, is that right? Um, how, how did, like, the group progress? How did he progress? And what was, what was the lifestyle like? Well, when we, I first went on tour... Um, Actually, the second tour I went, I think it was 81 tour. That was completely mad. The tours were mad. There was no organisation. You just fell out of bed. You went to the gig. I pulled out stuff for Ronnie to wear on the stage. I did his makeup. And then Keith and Mick had a big argument. 
and uh, they weren't talking to each other. So then they didn't tour again until 89. And then in 89, everything changed because they became more like a proper organised show rather than like a mad rock and roll show. Now suddenly there was makeup artists and wardrobe and all that and it was professional, nobody could be late, everything changed. It was much more fun in 81. But then it was also fun in, in 89, it was just different. So it changed in the way it became more professional, yeah. more of a show rather than a mad concert. Because like, obviously they're, they're, a, they're a massive band as well as brand. And I think anyone that gets attached to that via going out with them, being their soulmate, being married, your own profile suddenly goes up without even you wanting it because you're, you're married. Did you ever find people start treating you differently because now you're going out with him? Oh yeah, because people think of them as gods, aren't they? They're like heroes. And um, and I mean, the fa a, a, a story where, where we were at home and I went into, the, I was really scruffy, I'm usually scruffy, and I went into this antique shop because I saw this beautiful light I thought that would look so nice in the house. And the woman looked down at me. She said, I don't think you could afford that. No. I was so angry. So I went home and I said, come on, Ronnie, you've got to come to the shop with me. This woman needs to be taught a lesson. So we, he came with me and we walked into the shop. I said, uh, this is my husband. Ronnie, what do you think of that light? And he went, oh, yeah, that's great. Jo. And she was like, oh, it made me feel sick the way she was. She, they took it down, they let us try it in the house for a week. I mean, it was just, I was just thought, gosh, people are awful. It's crazy how, like, I still can't get my head around it now, how if you're famous or if you're rich, why they should treat you differently. You and, should all be and, treated and, the same. And your financial <clears throat> status shouldn't mean you're a good or a bad person. It's just your status. Like. Yeah, my mum always said, it doesn't matter who you are. You get good people that are dustmen. You get bad people that are dustmen. You get good people that are princes. You get bad people. Um, so she was always right. So I've always treated everybody the same until they fuck up. And Yeah. <laughs> And if they prove, I always trust them until they mess up. And when they mess up, then they've blown it. Um, this is, might be my own kind of uh, view and my own maybe concerns. If I, like, if I suddenly today, I mean, I'm happily married and got two kids, yeah. But if I suddenly married someone who was a high flyer, who I can't even think, who, who would I fancy and want to get married to? Uh, Let's Ooh. think about... I, I don't know why Britney Spears is coming into my head, but let's just say Britney <laughs> Spears, right? She's quite mad, but wouldn't... I would be concerned that because she's so high profile and good looking and talented and rich and famous, everything else, that loads of fellas would be throwing herself at them. Did you ever get concerned that Ronnie would just have all these fit females thrown at him? And yeah, really did. Yeah. Um, I used to always try and make friends with him to, you know, do it like that. But then in the end, he, he ran off anyway with somebody that was, you know, 19 when he was 62. Wow. I was pissed off at that, actually. But the saying that, he was a very difficult man. And as hard as it was when he left, um, uh, I thought... After a couple of months, I thought, I've got to get myself together. I can't just be moping around. He's not coming back. Um, and so I thought, right. And then I, I went out and I met Michael <laughs> uh, that day at the British Museum. <clears throat> uh, but what it did, once I realised that I didn't have to worry about a man that was always drunk and high, it was like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. Mm. And for me, then I... I thought, I'm going to go back to what I did when I first met Ronnie. I'm going to join a model agency and I'm just going to do stuff. So I joined a model agency and then I was asked to do Strictly Come Dancing, which was, thinking back, was a bit early for me because I hadn't been in front of a camera for myself since I was 22. Uh, so I 
but I did it anyway. I want, to, I want to talk to you about that. Just before I do, I'm going to ask you probably an obvious question, but I just want to ask it because I feel like this is the right moment. Did you, was it real love with Ronnie? Oh, yes, of course. And would you say he was the only person who broke your heart? Uh, yeah, well, no, he, Ronnie was the man I absolutely love and will always love. Yeah. Do you miss him? I don't think so. No, I don't miss him now. No. Are you in contact at all? Yeah, I texted him the other day. Uh, somebody sent me some old faces tapes. And I said, do you want these, Ronnie? He went, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you've got two, two wonderful kids anyway uh, with him. I didn't realise as well. So we represent Richard Hamilton and the guy who uh, resurrected his career. A couple of guys, but the main guy, a guy called Andy Val Morbida. And I believe, is it, name escapes me, is it Damien? Damien? Damien Hurst? No, no, no. Sorry, one of the woods, uh, one of the one of the sons. But I think Ty. Ty, that's it. Ty. He's actually been here. Oh, has yeah, he? Yeah, once before, and I didn't realise that Ronnie's actually an artist as well. Yeah, Ronnie's a good artist. Yes. Yeah, he's done all the years. He's done great pictures of me, which in my divorce I got all these pictures, drawings that he's done of me. Because they're worth so, a fortune now. Are they? Well, well uh, that's well, when I've looked. I mean, some of them are going for some serious money. Yeah, well, he's not bad, actually, Ronnie. I prefer his lion drawings much better to what he's doing now, but I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, he's a great artist. He'd, like, you know, he'd sit down and he'd just draw me just like that. Yeah. And be really good likeness. You could see it's me. Yeah, he's great. Um, I want to ask you one more thing about, like, the kind of old past, and then I want to actually talk to you about Strictly Come Dancing, because I think that that's, that's amazing. Um you know, like the drink, the drugs and stuff, Is it was it just alcohol and cocaine or was there anything else in the mix? Uh, oh, I did like a hash joint, me. Okay. Yeah. Um, Keith was did the heroin. Oh, that's, that wasn't for me. Um, he used to, you know, shoot up through his shirt, but that's... No, but I didn't... That wasn't that. I couldn't do that. Why, why, why do you think it's like such a culture that like even this guy here, Richard Hamilton, he was on drugs for like 30 odd years and there's some landscapes, which I'll show you next door sh shortly. When you look at the landscape, it looks like a sunset, but actually that landscape, it's the syringe, the blood going through the syringe and it makes yeah. a landscape and it's so out there and wild. And that's what makes him so great in a way. You know, the drugs, even though we wouldn't wish it on anybody, actually factored in towards his art. Why do you think so many like great people or great bands like the Rolling Stones had so much drugs to maybe get them through their life? I don't know, really. Um, maybe, I mean, Keith was always writing songs. He's written great songs whilst, I mean, look at Sister Morphine, you know, they were all on drugs then. Um, maybe they make them more creative, heighten their senses. I mean, me, when I used to take coke and stay up all night, I used to do things like rearrange rooms. <laughs> I don't know. And suddenly wake up the next day, oh, did I do all that? I rearranged <laughs> that whole room myself. But, um, and I used to write lots of poems, actually, when I was drinking and having a line. And I wrote a great poem the other day, just to prove that I don't need to do that. I, and I wrote it on what's going on now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do, do you think as well like sometimes it's like to help not saying you but like you know people in general to cover up like I know anxiety fear depression that kind of stuff I don't know you know I, I don't know why Keith did that heroin for so long because I used to watch him do it and he would get he would sort of just nod off and, and think well what's the point of doing that you're almost not enjoying it because you are... You're nodding alpha. off, yeah. yeah. I mean, what's the point? What are you doing? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> You're sitting there nodding off. In, the, in that uh, surrounding and obviously touring the world, uh, two other questions about that. Um, where's the best place you've ever travelled with the, with the group? And the Ceres. Okay, why? Oh, it was just brilliant. We arrived there and the Stones hadn't played in South America. And we arrived in Buenos Aires and there were thousands and thousands of people at the airport and they all followed the cars to the hotel and they stayed outside the hotel the entire time we stayed there. 
And when we went to the show, it was 80,000 a night for five nights they did. And the, sh- the crowd jumped as one. You'd never seen anything like it. It was just amazing. It was the a- adrenaline from the people was just intoxicating. It was just incredible. And um, obviously, the you know Ronnie and everybody else are uber, uber successful, famous, and you know all the other stuff that comes with it. But there must have been other people that you met along the journey who are also very, very successful. When you used to go to concerts and stuff, is there anyone else that really stood out for you? For that that person, that female Mal, was such an iconic person. I got to meet them. Loved Prince. Oh man, he was great. He was just great, but he was tiny, man. Was he? he was tiny. And he used to wear these really high shoes. And I went up and talked to him, <laughs> and I didn't know what to say. I was like, I just was in awe of him. He he came across like when I saw an interviews with him, quite soft. Was he? Was Prince quite soft, or was yeah, he? Yeah, he was very quiet. It was very quiet, and it was sort of you try and talk to him, and he doesn't say much back, which was like really. But he opened for um, the Stones. I can't remember what year it was now. And he came on stage wearing stockings and spender belt. And you think, oh my God, what is that guy doing? <laughs> but then his music was just... Ronnie played with him a, a, quite a few times at, at his gigs. He was a great musician. Um, but he was so cool. I just wanted him to be my best friend. <laughs> and, so, and then David Bowie was the other <coughs> great one. And he used to come... When we were living in New York, he we used to hang out with David a lot. Oh, both, 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 all of them are legends. Yeah, the only one I would have loved to have met was John Lennon, but he died, he was shot, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it Strawberry Fields? Is that the song? Strawberry yeah. Fields forever. Yeah. I just got back from New York a couple of weeks ago. we just done like a little documentary thing over there and we went to Central Park where he's got that shrine. Yeah. He was shot by a fan, wasn't he? They say, who knows? You just never know. You never know. I'm all into the conspiracy theories, me. (laughs) You never know. It could be an alien. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, Strictly Come Dancing. You said you felt like you was on there a little bit too soon. Why did you say that? Well, I'd just come out of my marriage and uh, I'd never done anything like that. I was, you know, live on telly. And they kept saying, come on, do it, Joe, do it, do it, do it. So my mum said, Josephine, Josephine, you've got to do it. So I, um, I did, but I, was, I thought I was useless. I hated it, actually. I hated trying to learn to dance. I thought it was gonna, I was going to, yeah, Joe, you're going to do this. Yeah, you're going to be great. But it was learning the steps, and that was the hard, that was the hard part. Would you say it was a, quite a lot of pressure? Yeah. Um, but I had Brendan Cole, and... He was very good to me. We became good friends. He's still my mate. And uh, yeah. so since then, so I know you're obviously an entrepreneur, business person. What have you been doing since then? Any other any other stints on different different programs? Yeah, I did Master Chef. Okay. Um, and in 2018, I did Bear Grylls the Island. How was that? I loved it. It was brilliant. Plonked on the island in the middle of the ocean, with a bunch of people with nothing but some knives and some hooks and that was it and they say survive you were truly gone organic then it was great i loved it i loved every second of that time on the island i caught the first fish but then it was a poisonous one so i couldn't (laughs) eat it um i did all the cooking okay we made camp we made shelter we it was just brilliant. It was just that whole... We had no phones, no TV, no nothing. And you survived. You learned that this is the most... Im- water's the most important thing for our survival. It's, you're very vulnerable out there. I just, I just really... Because Bear Grylls comes in at the beginning and says, not all of you are going to survive. I sat there and I thought, I am. I just knew I wasn't going to go anywhere. I was going to be there for the 28 days. And I did. Would you say that's part of your characteristic? You're like a, a fighter, survivor? Yeah, yeah. And where'd you get that from? God only knows. I don't know. But I, I loved doing the island. It was brilliant. 
And what would you say like the biggest lesson or the biggest life lesson you got from doing something like that? Um, well, you, I know that I could survive. If, if you dropped me off somewhere in the middle of nowhere, I'd survive. Yeah. So for me, it was just re- reassuring myself. Yes, Joe, you could do that. You can do that. Yeah. Um, we're obviously going into 2022 very, very soon. And we're in a era where social media, the internet and AI and things like that seems like it's taken over. There's obviously pluses to it. There's downsides to it. I'm 36 years of age and I remember life before social media. But I'm now speaking to like these younger people who are young entrepreneurs and they Don't do know. not know life um, without it and they are stuck to it all the time. And I am a victim of it because doing podcasts and everything else, I'm always on my phone. Yeah. But I'm a bit more conscious that, well, I, I could survive without it before, so I should be able to do it now. I want to ask you, so like obviously you've gone through great stuff, mad stuff, crazy stuff, you toured the world. I mean, you've seen it all pretty much. Yeah. You've actually got really good following, like all my 30,000 verified on Instagram what's your take on social media is it a good thing is it a bad thing um well for me for my for me i i love it because i can oh, i just like doing it put p- different pictures of my life and bits and products and stuff like that uh but i don't want to get too too hung up on it i went to my sister's at the weekend and she i was on that looking at my phone she said put your phone down I thought oh gosh okay and and I know that I do look at it too much but I I, mean, I don't I don't know my granddaughter's 12 and uh, she's a brilliant photographer she takes the best pictures she's always on Instagram TikTok doing all the you know it's just second nature to her yeah and my grandson goes gran um what games did you play when you were a little girl? <laughs> I said, I skipped. I had a bike and I used to build, I used to build camps in the garden. Look at that. Same person, still built, you can still do that. Me and my wife went for a walk, which we try and do every weekend. And uh, got my, my, the youngest is only three, three, three months old. And I got my other oh. son who's, who's just turned three. He's normally on his little bike and we've got the other one in the pram and we're walking around and looking around and we always say the same thing. When we were younger, you would see so many kids in the streets outside the house, houses yeah. either throwing stones up against something or... Kicking a ball, picking a ball or, or playing tag or it or something like that. And now you don't really see that and I think it's all because of the, the phones and the, the yeah. tablets and that kind of stuff. Do you think it's going to play a major problem in, in kids like mental health as a grown up what does it do to their brains doing these games Otis is brilliant he's six and he's brilliant at these games he's a clever kid he could read really early he can do maths his dad's clever uh, what is it doing to his brain is it making it better but he plays those games he plays Roblox um, what's the other Fortnite mm. and he's does them really good is it making them better or is it making them worse i don't know it, are they losing re- contact with reality you know he can't ride a bike i bought him a bike for his birthday this year and he still hasn't learned to ride it he's busy doing this and they lose so many hours of their of their days and weeks and, and months take it away from him and they go berserk and he goes berserk like he's coming down from a, you know he just freaks out and then finally he calms down and he's all right so leah's always taking it away from him uh. i'm a little bit concerned about it in the future i, I do boxing so for, for me when you go down to a boxing gym and especially when you start sparring in a ring with someone else there's no other distraction it doesn't matter yeah. your gender your race your, your sex your beliefs your religion once you get in there it's like an equal playing field which i love it and it makes you tough i do think we're in a bit of a snowflake era where people get offended so easy and you can't say yes. this you can't say no. that and it's all like come on like where where is where is the bit of tough spirit come from I don't know. Where's what's it going gone? On. I mean, would would we be able to get an army of blokes out to fight at the moment? Who knows? I don't know. I think they'd all be too scared. I went to um, the fashion awards the other day, 
and there were more transgenders there at the fashion awards and blokes wearing dresses with big shoulders and beautiful makeup and I thought, gosh, the world has changed. I hadn't been to the fashion awards for about eight years and now I look around and I thought, Jesus, what's going on? I was going to ask you this. So like someone like you who's been like, had all this like, so much good stuff happening in your life and you've done so much. What do you actually do now these days? Like downtime and hobbies and that kind of stuff. What what, what do you get up to, Joe? Um, well, I've just finished. <laughs> My son said to me, Ty said to me uh, in the summer, um, he said, Mum, I want to renovate the barn. I said, Ty, you can't do that. You have never renovated a barn. He said, give us a chance. I said, all right, off you go. So um, we renovate. I did a little bit of helping. I actually, I did the decoration and all that inside, like, interior stuff uh so we've been doing that we opened our bar last week we turned it into a cool bar uh so we opened that what else have i been doing oh i'm working on new products uh i've got these bar sorts coming out all organic and each one does something different four of them all different colors um so that's coming out it was supposed to come out last month but then we decided to do it after the New Year, doing that. Um, Also, getting, sorting through loads and loads of photographs because they want me to do the next book. I did a book called Stoned. Okay. All my old photographs from on tour, but I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of them. So they said, do one book, which came out in 2019, and they want me to start, so I've started sorting that for the next book. Now it's going to be called Too Stoned. (laughs) <laughs> Bucker. Let's go um, there. <laughs> so Christmas New Year, what are you getting up to? Hopefully, um, me, my daughter, and her husband and the kids, we're going to go to Tanzania. Lovely. That's good. Fingers crossed. Hopefully, they don't bloody try and lock us down again. I know. Or make us f- quadruple jabbed or something ridiculous. It's not me, mate. <laughs> I've had it. Well, would I need a jab for something I've had? Exactly. Maybe I shouldn't say that. No, exactly. No, I'm on the same page as you, 100%. And I think it should be about choice. I've said yeah. this a few times on my podcast. I don't think anyone should be coerced into anything they don't want to do. Yeah. I wouldn't force anyone to eat my diet, for example, even though yeah. I believe it's healthy for me. I would yeah. never do that. I would say, here is the what I would perceive as the facts or evidence. It's up to you to make your own interpretation of it. I think if I hadn't had it and was like laid out for a week... Um, uh, I think I would think about having a jab, but I can't get my head around having a jab for something I've had. You know, the jab is if to protect you so you don't get it. Yeah. Uh, but if you've had it, then what do you need the jab for? And I've got antibodies. I went to the doctor, got my antibody test. I'm getting an antibody test very soon. Yeah, my antibodies are high. <coughs> it's good. Yeah. It's good. Well, it's a testament to the fact that you keep yourself in good nick. Yeah. Well-being, organic. I'm boxing, I'm boxing on Thursday. Have you ever sparred? Once. How did you get on? It was just awful. <laughs> it was such hard work. <laughs> um, I don't want to keep you too much longer. What are you up to tonight? Um, I'm driving back to Northamptonshire. Lovely. Good. Yeah, because tomorrow I am doing a program with my friend Bricks called Pointless. Okay. What's that about? It's like a quiz show. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, on I, TV? Yeah. It's called Pointless and you have to get the most pointless answer. Okay. <laughs> I can't understand. I, I've been coerced into doing it with my friend Bricks. <laughs> I look forward to seeing it. Where can people find you, Joe? Um, on my Instagram, Joe Wood Official, Twitter, Joe Wood Official. That's it. Good stuff. All right, I've got one more thing. I've got a mantra. Yeah, go on. And my mantra is this: Be happy. Yeah. Never content. Oh. I've got my reason why I come up with that mantra. But if I were to ask you, Josephine Wood Official, yeah. Yeah. what does "Be happy, never content" mean to you? Uh, be happy. You can only be really happy if you've got your health. Um, so the health, the health thing is very important. Uh, be content. Never be content. Well, I suppose it's always striving for more then, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Everyone go Woo-hoo! and follow jo- Josephine. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast episode, please share it. Please leave a comment. And always remember to be happy, never bloody content. Nice one. Exactly. Thank you.
Great. <laughs>